fact, there was something even more going on that had, some, had something to do with glycosylation of the viral spike. And so it became really interesting. So the first thing I did, you know, not the first thing, but I said, okay, let me go look around because I'm kind of, that's kind of what I do. I mean, one of the things I've done over the years, you know, I haven't published as much on it as I have. I've really been into breast cancer clinical trials and kind of trying to understand a little bit of the immunology of breast cancer. There's actually, you know, I do this phosphonase, do all these clinical things in breast cancer, but I've always been interested in the back of my mind in molecular biology and trying to use it to explain things. Because it's what I did, I got my PhD in, you know, and a kind of quasi postdoc in the medical student. I mean, I initially found mutations in osteogenesis imperfecta uh, as my PhD thesis, and then I found the first mutation in, um, in the glucocorticoid receptor when I kind of was a little postdoc as a med student. So I've always been kind of wanting to do this. I just never, you know, things is life, it just happens and you kind of do other things. And so I started looking very carefully. Uh, and the way you do this, and I think most of your guys who are watching this understand this, is that we are able to look at all the sequences in real time, almost near real time, because the viral sequencing in 2020 is a lot easier to do. It takes a couple hours. And there's a, there's a lot of guys, that they, it's G-I-S-A-I-D, it's a German group uh, that's really responsible for collating all the sequences around the world. And everybody gets to look at them. And there's been a number of publications that have come out recently from a lot of really, really good groups, the really, really elegant publications, where they've looked at these sequences and they said, wow, these are really cool. And they try to analyze it. So again, I don't have access to this. I'm a medical oncologist. I don't have a lab of 50 people to help me out. So what I did is looked at something called Next Strain. It's N-E-X-T strain.org. And they, what they've done is you're able to visualize all the sequence data online. And you know, again, it was a very naive thing of me to do. I, you know, I don't know, you know, there's a lot of things and a lot of, what's the word? There's a lot of statistical error in these. That you've got to do a lot of things. You've got to be very careful of when you make these analyses. Uh, and so, you know, with all those caveats in mind, um, what I did was I you initially saw very quickly, uh, just looking at this, that a particular mutation in the spike, a change of aspartic acid at, at uh, 614 to a glycine, seem to arise pretty early. And again, with all the caveats, you know, I understand this, I'm not going to put myself out there at all as a, as a, you know, a bioinformatician and biostatistical person. Uh, I know them all, but yeah, I know a lot of them, the good ones, but I'm not putting myself out there at all. And what was seemed to be happening was that this mutation D16, D14G seemed to be, uh, you know, arisen fairly quickly um, uh, in sometime in Wuhan uh, and then spread at least from Wuhan to like it looked like to me initially to my naive view, um, like it looked like it went to Europe and then it went from Europe to the East Coast of the United States. And so what was interesting is when you did an analysis of it, you look at my paper, and this was published, I think, about two and a half, three weeks ago in the Journal of uh, Medical Virology. When you look, and again, it was a speculative paper. It wasn't anything saying this is the answer. I'm just putting it out there for the medical community to see. Run with it, guys, if you want. And I put this out there, and it turns out that the D14G, the D, the ancestral G, I mean, the ancestral D, aspartic acid, was on the West Coast, and the glycine was on the East Coast. And if you look at the number of deaths per million on the West Coast, a lot less than the deaths per million on the East Coast. Now, again, that's a naive sort of thing, just throwing it out there. It's a correlation, and we all know correlation isn't causation. You know, but it's an okay, I just threw that out there. It's interesting, you know, as we looked at it a little bit further, um, it turns out that this mutation at 614 in the viral spike influences the glycosylation of 616. So these guys did this whole, and it's this whole thing, this whole statistical analysis that, you know, that people have been doing for years. It started, I think, in the 1980s or 1970s, because I put out a paper. What they do is that you look at all the glycosylation sites, and statistically, you can tell what amino acids do better for glycosylation than others. And basically, you took uh, aspartic acid which to me, you know, was charged. It was kind of like acidic, if I'm not mistaken. I forget that, but I think it's acidic. And what you do is you make it into a glycine, which is more kind of nonpolar. And it turns out the more nonpolar you are in like the 10, five or 10 amino acids around a glycosylation site for a lot of structural very, again, I'm not a structural biologist, but my understanding of this is that for the structural biology piece of it, if you change it a little bit, it can change the probability of glycosylation. And remember, in medicine, everything's a probability. It's not yes or no. It's the possibility of it. So one could argue plausibly that it was changing the glycosylation at 616 and, and theoretically increasing virulence. And so we put that out there. And it turns out in retrospect, this has now become a big thing in the last few days because all the big time people, the people really who are the big time, you know, biostatisticians and virologists who understand this have now put out, at least in preprints, um, and I think one is actually, one or two have been accepted already, 
um, and, and actually our publications have been peer reviewed and put out there already, then in fact, this is at least, they think this mutation is important in terms of transmissibility maybe, virulence maybe, it's all the debate. We don't know if it's more virulent or not. There's a really, really nice paper that the group from Los Alamos put out. I actually talked to those guys, you know, a little bit when it came, when I saw it because they referenced me in their paper. And I said, oh, let me kind of talk to you guys and see what's going on. And yeah, we were talking a little bit about it. We went back over by email a little bit. And, you know, it's interesting. So, so the bottom line is that they weren't thinking about glycosylation until I kind of started talking to them about it. And, then, you know, who knows if it's right or not? We don't know. And so we did that. And so then we had to ask the question, well, why? Why is this happening? What does this have to do with SARS-CoV-2? Why would glycosylation of the viral spike make a big difference? I mean, I had that theory from a few weeks ago, but, how, you know, is that really the case? So what you do is, again, you go back to the SARS literature. And in the SARS literature, it's, it's all fairly well known that viruses, or at least coronavirus, at least in the case of SARS, uses not only ACE2, but actually a co-receptor called DC sign. And it's actually L sign on endothelial cells as well as type 2 pneumocytes of the lung. And what these receptors are is there a whole class of receptors called mannose receptors. And what they do is they're responsible for binding carbohydrate-related antigens. So it's kind of a co-receptor. And what they do is that, you know, you bind to ACE2, it's kind of a, it's kind of a key, it's a two-key sort of thing. The ACE2 kind of directs it there. And then whether that gets internalized into the cell or not is really dependent on your DC sign in the case of dendritic cells and your L sign in the case of endothelial, uh, dendritic and endothelial cells, and I think L sign in the case of type 2 pneumocytes. And these are really, really interesting proteins. They're quite fascinating when you start talk, thinking about them. But it turns out these guys did these experiments. And they progressively deleted amino acids from a spike protein lentivirus. It was, a light, it was basically a pseudotype lentivirus that has spike protein on it. And they kept deleting it. And it turned out the more you delete it, it didn't really affect their binding to ACE2. It affected their binding to DC sign, at least in this experiment. And so, in fact, it also the, looked at the infectivity of the virus. It was less. And it seemed to be mediated through DC sign. And so that's when I got a, a really hardcore, really very, very, very bright and actually, you know, pretty well-renowned immunologist, a guy named Mike Lotz involved. And Mike really has been looking at the dendritic cell for almost his entire career and knows probably more about it than just about anybody around. And Mike and I started batting this back and forth. And, you know, we said, well, what would happen if the dendritic cell was infected? What does it do? And one of the other things we found out fairly quickly was that if you go back again to the SARS literature, we don't have any literature now for SARS-CoV-2 because it's only been 10 weeks, you know? These things take time to do experiments, do them right. And when you go back to the SARS literature, what you find is that what happens with SARS is that it infects the dendritic cell but doesn't grow. It just sits there in the lysosome and kind of messes with the dendritic cell because dendritic cells are really, it's kind of fascinating what they do. What dendritic cells do is they search around, they're like in all the tissues, they look around, and if they see something they don't like, like an antigen, like a bacteria, they kind of suck it up. They endocytose it. It's called pinocytosis or phagocytosis. They suck it up and then they hold it. Usually they chew it up and then present it on the surface of the cell as antigens for the immune system to react to. But what was happening with this virus apparently is in SARS, and it's probably going to be SARS-CoV-2, I believe, at the end of the day. What happens is that it sucks it up and then it just stays there. It doesn't grow. It just sits there. And then what happens is that the immune system goes, well, where's the dendritic cell? You know, where is it? I, I need a response. What's going on? And either the T cells run away or they apoptose or something else like that. So it might got into all this stuff. You know, this is hardcore immunology. And a lot of immunologists have been puzzling about this, why all the T cells go away. And Mike thinks, I think, and I, I think we agree, that is probably because the dendritic cell is being infected and it's kind of staying in this immature tolerant state. You know, dendritic cells have to mature. So they have to basically chew the, when they present the antigens on their surface, suddenly it becomes suddenly a different kind of dendritic cell. It's what's called a mature dendritic cell. And so that's what's happening. So what happens with the virus is it holds onto these virions. This is the theory. It may be wrong, but again, we're just throwing it out there for people to talk about. What happens is that we throw it, they, suddenly they wait for the immune system to kind of collapse a little bit locally and even all everywhere, but they wait for it to collapse a little bit because the dendritic cells in the lung aren't really doing what they're supposed to do. And then once it collapses a little bit, it spits it back out. It's called the viral synapse. And what's cool about that, not cool, and I shouldn't say cool, it's a pandemic, but what's interesting about that is that HIV does the same thing. HIV does the exact same thing. HIV sucks in the virus, waits for the immune system to kind of mess around with it, waits for the CD4 cell to come close, and then spits it all back out 
right into the um, right into the T cell, the CD4 T cell. That's kind of and that's no, that's like 20, almost 8, 17 years old. There's some really interesting work that's been done with that. So that's kind of what we think is going on, and it explains a lot, right? It explains the T cell lymphopenia that you get. It explains probably when the virus is spit out a few days later, maybe, you know, that, you know, what's happening here is that suddenly you have this giant immune, because the immune system's caught up, right? There, you know, there's still being antigens that are being processed in the periphery, other places. And so you're still making B cells, you're still making antibody, you know, and then suddenly all this virus comes out of the middle of nowhere, it's being spit into the, you know, wherever, and boom, you know, you get the cytokine storm, you activate the macrophages, they turn to M1, you get IL-6 production, et cetera. And so that's kind of the theory behind this. And so that has a bunch of predictions. The nice thing about a theory is that it predicts stuff, right? You know, it not only predicts what you see initially, but it actually predicts things that are things that you wouldn't have expected. So, you know, it predicts a T cell loss. It predicts, more importantly, at least to me, it predicts virulence. Because, you know, the, the issue with this whole thing, I mean, where do we go now? That's the central question of our time. You know, we did the social distancing. It looks like everything's going away, at least temporarily. But the mystery that everybody has, and no one knows the answer to this, you know, is the epidemiologists tell us that if we go outside and start to mix, everything's going to get really bad again. We've got to be very careful, which may be true. There's no way saying we just don't know. That's the thing we just don't know. But on the other hand, you know, what we could say is that if it's attenuating a little bit, maybe a lot, that maybe we can kind of alter kind of what we do and kind of alter our thought process a little bit based on whether it's attenuated. And so, you know, so the prediction is that if you go start looking around, not only will you see mutations that are more virulent, that give more glycosylation like D614G, but actually ones that make less, you know, and in fact, that's starting to happen. So what's happened now is that there are spike protein mutations that are being found we found a preprint from a bunch of guys in Taiwan, I think it was, who had done this. And, you know, we looked at, they had, they, they posted about 13 mutations they had found. Again, these are hardcore bioinformaticians. I'm not one, but they posted these and, um, on a preprint. And when you look at them really carefully and you say, how do they affect NXST sites, these, these you know, hypothetical glycosylation sites, these canonical glycosylation sites, how do they affect them? And in fact, in two of them, they make it more virulent, one of them being D16G, D14G, or D614G, and the other ones being less glycosylation. And in fact, there was one, there was two of them that you lost a site, there was one or two of them that predicted for decreased glycosylation. And so, you know, the theory kind of makes sense, it kind of fits a little bit. Um, what was also interesting is that a bunch of guys in China, again, this hasn't been published yet, as far as I know, it's in a preprint, they looked, they took a bunch of viruses out uh, you know, they culture, not culture them, because when you culture the virus, it makes its own mutation. So you really got to be very careful. You know, you got to take the virus as soon as you take it out. Don't, don't put it in culture, but just dump it right onto cells so it doesn't mutate so you can get an idea of how virulent in culture it is. You know, even looking at the site of pathogenicity uh, in culture, looking at the, uh, looking at kind of, you know, the, the viral load that you get, you know, after like, I think 24 and it's 48 and 72 hours. You know, so you can kind of see how virulent they are in those, with those definitions. And what happened is that they had a variance. They had like 11 or 12 cultures on these guys that they've got the patients in Wuhan, and they had a variation up to 270-fold in their virulence. And it, it was interesting. So the ones that look more like the ones that were in Washington on the West Coast of the United States looked, were very non-virulent at all. I mean, they were virulent. They did stuff. But again, this is cell culture. Who knows what they're doing human beings? But on the other hand, they definitely, you know, they grew less. The cells didn't look as bad when they put them on them. There was less viral load, as opposed to the ones that look more like the, the ones in Europe. You know, that they were closer on the phylogenetic tree that the ones in Europe were like, you know, in the case of one of them, 19 times more, almost 200 times more. Now, there's a bunch of different mutations of these, not just the spike protein ones, but, you know, it kind of all makes a little bit of sense about what's going on and explains things. So, you know, clearly, it looks like, at least with a first approximation, that there are multiple strains of the virus circulating around all of which have a slightly different amount of virulence. Now, viral evolutionary theory, you know, and there's a lot of it, it's a really interesting theory that's been going on, suggests that when you introduce a virus into a new host, it attenuates over time.